Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to be coming to you via streaming services. Uh, the Lord is good, and I'm glad to be able to, and I'm thankful to be able to bring the word of the Lord to you today. I give honor to you, the congregation, to our pastors, for an opportunity to share the word of the Lord with you. Uh, we're going to be covering this morning lesson 1.2, Striving for the Faith. Striving for the Faith. And the big idea of our lesson is to contend for the faith, we must be willing to take a stand. To, be, to contend for the faith, we must be willing to take a stand. And uh, before I get started into the foundation of our lesson, I wonder if you would just join me for a word of prayer over our lesson this morning. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for your spirit. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for its truth and the light that it is unto us. I pray today, God, that as we delve into your word, that your light would shine in our hearts and that you would lead us and guide us by your spirit into deeper truth. Lord, I pray today that as we journey together through your word, that you would fill us with strength, that you would reinvigorate our hope, reinvigorate our vision, reinvigorate our strength. Lord, you are our portion today, and we desire you, God, with our whole heart, and we are thankful, God, to gather today in our homes in this moment, Lord, to entertain your spirit, to entertain your very presence, God, among us, and we just ask you, Lord, to have your will and to have your way in our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our foundation begins with discussion on the early church in the book of Acts. And the early church in the book of Acts was a revival church. It was a growing church. It had growing pains like any growing congregation. Part of those growing pains was a need to appoint more ministers on staff. A decision was made to appoint seven young ministers of good report to be on staff and help with the daily duties for the growing Christian congregation in Jerusalem. Stephen was one of those chosen to serve in this capacity. Stephen is listed first, which may indicate he was one of the leaders in this group. He was used in the gifts, and great miracles were accomplished under his ministry. One thing we know for sure, he was a powerful, anointed, and fearless preacher. His sermon in Acts 7 indicates that he was well-educated in the Old Testament. The combination of faith Knowledge and boldness made him a convincing preacher of the gospel. He did not pull any punches in his preaching. He was not per politically correct. He was not religiously correct. In fact, he told the Jews their temple was just a building and God was much bigger than their building. He charged their fathers with killing the prophets who foretold of Christ's coming and they were co-conspirators in his death. Lastly, he declared they had not kept the law. With that final indictment that they had not kept the law, they went a little crazy. They picked up stones to stone him, uh, but as the stones were crashing upon him, young Stephen began calling out to God. Standing nearby was a young lawyer named Saul. He was brilliant. He had been trained in the best schools and by the best teacher. He was ambitious. He was focused. And as, Roman, and as a Roman citizen, he worked all the legal channels and gained permission from the local authorities to allow that mob to take Stephen's life. The Romans were tired of all the uprisings. They wanted all the insurrection to stop as quickly as possible. Instead of recanting or begging for mercy, Stephen declared, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. This event not only ignited the church, but it also left an indelible impact on the heart and mind of young Saul. Little did he know, but the Lord had plans for him and would soon transform his life. But today I want to talk about Stephen for a little bit. Stephen was a man of good report. I think a good report is something that we could all strive for and all desire to have. Uh, all desire to have said of us. And the ancient historian Jose Josephus recorded seven judges being appointed to oversee the surrounding cities of Galilee. Stephen is believed 
uh, to have been one of these judges. He was a man full of the Spirit and of good report. Being of good report meant he was a man who just knew how to get stuff done. He was a man who people believed in to accomplish his appointed tasks. And that's a pretty big statement to be made, especially if we think of ourselves uh, and, and we relate it to ourselves, to be of good report, to be someone who can be counted on, to be someone who you can count on them to complete their task. And this is what Stephen had said of him. He was a man that just knew how to get the job done. Elisha was a similar man in the Bible who seemed like he was able to just get things done. Elisha is believed to have been a wealthy man since the text described, his, uh, described him as owning a team of 12 oxen. Elisha seemed to be a man who knew how to get things done. He would go behind uh, the rest of the oxen in the field. He would be the last one behind plowing, kind of keeping his eyes on the rest of them, keep, kind of keeping his eyes on the other, the other teams of oxen. And he plowed this field. And he was obviously successful at it because he had 12 oxen. Not many people had that many cattle in that day. But soon after, uh, in, in 1 Kings 19, 19, Elijah saw Elisha. Elijah went up to Elisha and threw his mantle upon him. And it was soon after this that Elisha began to follow Elijah. In fact, Elisha became Elijah's servant and served the man of God faithfully. And I think that this is the first premise to just point out, that if we're going to be faithful and if we're going to serve faithfully, there's almost an expectation that we have to be able to get the job done. And I wonder today if we take inventory of our lives, if we take inventory of the Word of God that we have heard in our ears, whenever we have heard God compel us to do A, B, and C, or to, to act upon His Word. Maybe He's told us to speak to our neighbor, or maybe He's told us to give someone a Bible study or to pray more. I wonder if we have been able to get the job done. Because if not, to what degree then can we be charged as faithful? Amen. I want to be known today as faithful. I want to be known as one that when I hear the Word of God, when I hear His voice speak into my life, that I am obedient and that I get the job done so that I will be seen and be known as one who is faithful. You see, for Elisha, when he first began serving Elijah, there was no promise of the supernatural. There was no promise of a promotion. For all Elisha knew, this was his calling, his destiny, to serve Elijah for the rest of his life. After many years of serving, it became clear Elijah would not be around long. Elijah would be taken up by a fiery chariot as it swooped down to pick him up. And Elisha would be left shielding his eyes from the glory. See, Elisha did not have long to think about what was happening because floating down from that ball of fire was Elijah's mantle. This was a mantle of one who was faithful. This was a mantle of one who had proven to be able to get the job done as well, but not just in a field, but in the Lord's field. This was the second time, however, that the mantle had fallen upon Elisha. But this time, it came from the hand of God. At first, the mantle represented the mantle represented service, but the second time, the mantle represented the supernatural. Elisha would have never received the mantle of the supernatural without first being willing to take up the mantle of service. Because the truth is that everyone wants the second mantle, but no one wants the first mantle. Everyone wants a word, but no one wants the work. Everyone wants the fire, but no one wants the fight. Everyone wants the supernatural, but no one wants the sacrifice. The second mantle was predicated on the first. The faith that carried Stephen through his suffering was obtained through his willingness to serve. 
Striving for the faith is about serving in the kingdom and then watching God do his part in giving us the gifts we cannot give ourselves. So in the moment today as you take inventory, as we begin our lesson, to consider the word of God in the way that you've heard him speak into your life, if you will take a step into that service, if you will take a step into serving God as he had called you to, and as he has called you to, I can guarantee that you can expect after your service, after your obedience, a second mantle to fall, and your eyes will behold the supernatural like you've never seen it before. And it just takes a step of faith to be faithful as God has called you and told you today in the direction, and to just respond in the direction God has led you. Whether it be more prayer, whether it be reaching a family friend, whether it be an act of kindness to someone who has fallen on hard luck, whatever it may be, maybe it's more discipleship, uh, maybe, it's just, maybe, maybe it's just changing the way you live, but God will reveal to you the supernatural when you begin to respond at the first word that he's spoken into your life. And sometimes we don't see the supernatural because we get stuck wrestling with obedience in the first, with the first word God gave us. That after we get through that first word and we respond in obedience, you can guarantee that there will be signs that follow you as you respond to the gospel and as you respond to his word in your life. Amen. That's what I want today. That's what I desire today. And if you just lift your hands where you're at and just speak unto the Lord, God, that's what I want. If I've struggled with this obedience, Lord, I want to obey with the first word. I want to obey the first word that I heard you speak into my life. Lord, I want to obey the first word that I heard you speak when you told me to go unto all the world, Jesus, and to anybody that I could reach. Lord, I want to respond to that today. And if I've been slack, Lord, if I've been slack in obeying that word, Jesus, forgive me and empower me as I know, Lord, that your spirit does, Lord, to respond to your word. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. I guess a question could be asked, or, you, or the question could be posited, what are some character traits every Christian should have? Well, instead of going through a whole list of them, I'll just posit this to you today. It's single-mindedness. Single-mindedness. Returning to the story of Elisha, let's, uh, let's look at how Elisha was single-minded. Was single you see, when Elijah threw his mantle over Elisha, there was a radical shift. Elisha sent, went and slew his oxen and cooked them on the fire generated by burning the farm equipment he had once held so dear. He then served his oxen to the hungry. You see, the man of God came by, Elisha, and the covering he received was the moment God said, you're too rich with the wrong stuff, and you've been plowing too long in the wrong field. And whenever... Elisha heard this, and whenever this transition happened in his life, Elisha responded. And I wonder if we could think about that today, if we're too rich with the wrong stuff, and if we've been plowing in the wrong field for too long. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, we've heard, we've heard sermons, wonderful sermons on the field that we're called to, the heavenly field that we're called to work and to sow and to reap in. And I wonder today what things we have been rich with that God never intended us to be, to be that rich with. You know, consider, consider all the, the toys that exist. Consider all the distractions that exist. All the ways that we find to comfort ourselves when all along God is calling us to just trust in Him today. To trust in Him. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I'm just going to start right here and just tell you. Whenever the Lord spoke to me and was talking to me about this lesson, I remembered the trip I took. Uh, now it's years ago, but I was about 19, and I went to Nicaragua, and we were in that jungle. Uh, we were far away from we were far away from any medical medical help. If 
if one of us got sick or got hurt, we were going to be in some real trouble. And it was there that I just felt a pull in my faith. And I said, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I know this, that if I should perish, I've perished doing your will. And when I said that to God, I felt every fear vanish. I felt every worry vanish. I felt every, uh, I felt every concern vanish. And maybe some of those things I used to think were important, it vanished. My false security in the medical field, my false security that the police were going to protect me, and my false security that I was not going to encounter any really dangerous animals in the woods, all of that, it, it just vanished as I began to trust in the Lord. Hallelujah, here today we're battling some things in our society, we're battling some things in our world, we're battling sickness, we're battling illness like we've never seen it before. But at the same time, it's, kind of, it's beginning to shake us. It's beginning to cause us to come to an awareness that we may, have put, we may have invested too much in those kinds of riches. When the Lord has said, I want you to have these kinds of riches. Hallelujah. And it's only what the Lord can provide us with today. It's only what God can give us today that can satisfy our souls you see, Elisha had enough. If for Elisha, Elisha's situation, if, if two of his oxen died, he still had ten more. And sometimes that's exactly where we find ourselves, oversaturated with wrong riches that make us stagnant. You may not be here today with more money than you know to, what to do with, but do, that does not mean you haven't set yourself up riches. It means you found other ways to be rich, and if you find yourself rich in any other way, then, how the, then rich in sacrifice, then be wary. Be wary. Consider how rich you are in sacrifice today, because it will be a good thing to compare with the other things that saturate our lives. You see, single-mindedness is ready to burn. It, it, it's ready to burn the riches of this world. For hope of riches in another. That's what single mindedness is. Single mindedness also had, also had influence on the field that Elisha was plowing. You see this field was probably a place Elisha had been plowing for a long time. Trusting that many oxen in the same field means. So, trust, so to trust in that team of oxen. You got 12 of them. Means that they would have had, had to been in some way trained. So they would have had to somehow been used to that field. And they were probably used to plowing it because they would have had to have been instructed. But that's when Elijah came around. His eye, and when Elijah came around, his eyes were open to a field beyond the one he'd been plowing. And a field no oxen would be useful in. He saw the field Elijah was called to. And I wonder what field we have been plowing lately. What field did God find us toiling away in? The wrong field is going to be a yoke of heaviness. The wrong kind of field will subject us to the, and will be subjected to the fallenness of Adam's sin, and it, it won't produce the necessities needed to sustain you like the field God has blessed and called us to. You won't find an easy yoke in that field, but if you'll accept the field God calls you to, and God's been trying to lead you into today, that yoke is easy. I want to remind you that we're called today to go into all the world. That we're called today to plow the field where we are asked and told. And we are commanded to love our brother as ourselves. To do good to them that hate and persecute us. These are other fields that you can't plow if you don't have a singleness of mind. How can you ever plow the depths? How can you ever plow the field? of loving your brother as yourself, as doing good to those that persecute you if you've never left the first place that God found you. And I'm calling us today to growth. I'm not condemning anyone necessarily today, but I'm simply preaching and speaking a message, a call to grow, a call to consider the voice of God in your life, where you've been and where God today is calling you to. Another thing about Stephen is that he was a man full of faith. 
He was a man who knew what it took to be single-minded. He was a man who had been charged like Elisha. He was a man who knew the call of God to a field of souls to reach, and he was not attached to the riches of this world. Contending for the faith requires us to be full of faith. There's no way that Stephen could have contended. There's no way that Stephen could have endured the stoning or he could have endured the persecution that he did. I don't know if Stephen would have thought to offer the prayer that he offered if he had not known how to contend for the faith and how to be full of faith. You see, faith will cause you to do different things. It may even cause you to do strange things. If, if you think it causes you to do strange things, it's because we are not of this world. And sometimes God kind of does, God, God kind of starts working in a way that defies our logic and defies other people's logic. And, and if you're full of faith, you'll know how to follow the voice of God. But those who are full of faith will fight for the faith. It is part of their core values. It is their master possession. It's not the old field that you were called from. No, it's, it's faith. It's not something they use for their benefit or set aside when it is inconvenient. It is their testimony. It is their lifestyle. It is the heartbeat of every passion. That is, this is what God seeks for. It is rare and it is beautiful. Something has to change you. Something has to remind you of the change you experienced when Jesus found you today. And let's return to the story of Elisha and Elijah. In 1 Kings 19.20, the word says, And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then will I will follow thee. And he said unto them, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? That's an interesting phrase. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? Huh. Essentially, Elijah tells Elisha, in other words, think about what I have done to thee. Think about what I have done to you. When I put my mantle on you, it wasn't just a normal mantle. It was a mantle where God did miracles through me as I wore it. It's a symbol of authority. It's a symbol of anointing. It's a symbol of calling. Think about what I have done to thee. Think about the fact that I just came along this field and I found you and I called you. Think about what I have done to thee. You see, sometimes we need to remember the field God called us from. Maybe you had a lot going for you, but that field was all you knew. Maybe you were somewhat successful in that old field. Maybe that old field was miserable. Maybe you thought you are going to die in the field you'd been plowing. But when God showed up, he brought you out, and he called you to come and learn how to plow in a different kind of field. If you're going to fight for your faith, you have to remember what has been done to you. You have to remember how you were lost, but you were found. You have to remember how you were miserable, but God gave you joy. You have to remember how you were sorrowful, but God broke in and gave you joy. Hallelujah. I'm thankful today for the way that the Lord has intervened in my life. You have to remember the way that the Lord found you chained by addiction and he set you free. You have to remember how you felt like you were never heard and how the ear of God came near to you. You have to remember today how no one, how no word from anybody could help you. But when you heard the voice of God, that was all it took to transform your life. You have to remember today where God found you. You have to remember it today. And if you can, hallelujah, if you can, you'll contend for the faith. You'll be reminded, you'll be filled again, I promise you, as you remember the testimonies, as you remember where God found you, you'll be filled again. You'll be encouraged today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for where the Lord found me and where he brought me out from. I'm thankful that the Lord found me when I felt alone. And he brought to me his company. I remember when I was full of grief 
And the Lord came near to me in his counsel, and he raised my heart up into fullness of joy, into expectation, because one day, one day I'll see my loved ones again. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's remember what God has done to us. Let's remember where God found us. A question can be posited as I move on. Is it possible to believe but not wholly believe? A better question to get at the root of this is to examine uh, how clean your break has been with the way you used to live. You see, Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Stephen was full of faith and led by the Spirit. And his, his resume spoke volumes of the nature to which each of us should strive. Uh, but as far as uh, when we operate in faith in the gifts of the Spirit, we should do so with wisdom and understanding. Being led by the Spirit is not a get-out-of-jail-free card or inappropriate behavior and speech. The Spirit will not lead us to embarrass others needlessly. But whenever we ask the question, how clean has our break been with the way we used to live, maybe we consider the story of Elisha, who, uh, who went and took the riches that he had, took his oxen, he, sl he, he slayed them, he killed them, he put them on an altar or a fire that was made by the farm equipment that he owned. There wasn't really any going back to that. Hallelujah. And it's no doubt, no doubt in my mind that Stephen would have had to have made a clean cut or a clean break with his life where God found him. Let me tell you about a couple other people in the Bible who were led by the Spirit but did not have a get-out-of-jail-free card. These were people who had made a clean break with old ways of living as well. These were true worshipers of a single mind. These men began their journey sailing into uh, Samothrace. Samothrace. Uh, I don't have my pronunciation marks on here, so. Uh, I want to say, anyway, I'm not, I like, I'm kind of big on pronunciations of words, as you could tell from the last lesson that I, uh, that I taught. Uh, the uh, the uh, Fabergé egg kind of threw me. But uh, anyway, if you haven't seen that one, you got to watch the first part at least. I want you to watch all of it. But if you only catch the first part, I promise you there's a laugh there for you. Because uh, Fabergé, or how, I don't even know if I'm saying it right right now. I don't have an audience. But maybe you can text me and tell me how to say that. But anyway, we're going on. Uh, the, the spelling of the word is S-A-M-O-T-H-R-A-C-E. So maybe you can give, maybe let's sound it out, Samothrace. Let's go with that. Anyway, moving on. This is where they were sail, sailing, sailing to, uh, where they eventually find themselves in Philippi. This, is, this was a wealthy city and home to the imperial cult a low Jewish population and where many gods were worshipped. It was here the men in our story encounter a slave girl who begins to harass them as they preach the gospel. The text tells the, pre, the, the, text tells the reader this woman had a spirit of divination. The Greek names as uh, the spirit of divination and the Greek names this the spirit of div, uh, divination. And I can say this, I know a little bit of Greek, Numa Pythona or a Pythonian spirit. Paul and Silas find themselves face to face with a hostile spirit. And Paul can tell this, this Paul can tell the spirit is merely using its vessel of the slave girl to harass them. So he commands it to come out in the name of Jesus. And the Pythonian spirit is helpless to resist. When the woman is freed, her masters become angry. Because she can no longer be used to make them money by soothsaying. For them, it appears that making money was more important than salvation. And the woman's masters bring the two men before a council in the city. They are charged with disrupting the city and bringing harm to the customs of the city. 
by rebuking the Pythonian spirit and taking away the woman's ability to tell the future and thus reducing the livelihood of her masters. They were turned over to the rod bearers for punishment where they were beaten with whips and chains in public. Bundled rods were the sign of Roman authority and justice with Paul. Uh, authority of uh, it, the, the bundled rods were the sign of Roman power, of authority and justice, which Paul and Silas were subjected to and then thrown into prison. And here they sat until around midnight when they began to sing. As they were singing, the earth shook violently in an earthquake, and all the cells were opened and the chains were loosed. The guard woke up and realized the prison had been opened and he would be executed for letting them escape. He began to take his own life when Paul told him not to hurt himself. They were all still there and none of them had left. It's interesting to note that earthquakes were seen in Hellenism as a theophany or an appearing of God. Here Paul and Silas had been made prisoners, but their God had set them free. It stands in stark contrast to the slave woman who was prisoner, but whose God did not come to free her. No Pythonian spirit came to free her from her captives that were using her. The only God who brought any sort of freedom was Jesus. And it was him who loosed the woman from her spirit. And he came in a demonstration of power for his servants. However, Paul and Silas did not flee when God showed up and gave them a get out of free jail card. No, instead he gave them a centurion who was going to kill himself for fear of being executed. But now he wants to know the God who showed up to save Paul and who and Silas. You see wisdom kept Paul and Silas from fleeing the jail, and their being filled with the Holy Ghost made them true worshipers. But what's interesting is in the middle of their single-mindedness, in the middle of their worship, in the middle of all of God's doing, there was a soul to be reached. And if Paul and Silas had been single-minded to escape, maybe they would have left. But something tells me they were single-minded in the mission of Jesus. And when there was a soul to reach, instead of fleeing, they stayed and they reached for a soul. Today, maybe you have been embarrassed. Maybe you've been beaten in public by life. Maybe you feel like you've been in a prison because you've not been able to go anywhere lately. That's pretty much all of us. Maybe you've been falsely accused. So let me tell you that no matter what place of captivity you find yourself in, there is a God who can make you free. And it's time to get single-minded that though the will of God may have brought you to places where it feels like you will be slain, yet I will hope in Him. Yet I will hope in Him. Everything may seem stacked against you, you may have been beaten by life, like I said. You may be in the darkest place you've ever found yourself. But I'm talking to someone today that's met with God, that's been filled with the Spirit. If you're going to be full of the Spirit and full of wisdom, you have to hope in Him today. And I would say that only being full of the Spirit and only, and only, only having wisdom can you look up in your circumstance and have hope. Today, if you haven't spent time in prayer, if you haven't spent time reading your Bible, if you haven't spent time singing in the midnight hour when there is basically no sign of hope, I'm not sure to what degree we're matching up to Stephen's life, let alone Jesus' Hallelujah. Bear with me for just a second. I didn't bring a nap, I didn't bring a uh, handkerchief, but I'm sweating pretty bad because there's some bright lights on my head. You're probably seeing it because it's shining right down and glaring. You're probably getting blinded by the sweat on my head. Praise the Lord. I'll go on. 
I want to be full of the Spirit today and full of wisdom. If you're not full of the Spirit, you may find yourself in a place where there aren't any more answers. You may find your, yourself in a place where you don't feel like worshiping. But if you find yourself there and you're not full of the Spirit, you won't have the worship life to be able to sing in the midst of it. And there are some trials you're going to need enough Spirit to sing through the beating. Let me say that again. There's some trials. You're going to need enough Spirit to sing through the beating that's going to come your way. To worship through the stagnation to hope for the next day. If you don't have enough Spirit today, if you've been feeling kind of low, if you've been feeling like you've been beat spiritually, I'm telling you today that God wants to renew your strength, that God wants to refill you today with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, then if I'm speaking to you today, stand up in your room, stand up wherever you're at, lift your hands, and receive the Holy Ghost. Receive again a portion of the Spirit. Receive strength today. Receive hope today. Receive encouragement today. I speak it into your life. Be filled again today with the baptism of of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody needs strength renewed. Somebody needs to sing in their trial. Somebody needs to sing in the midnight hour. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice today. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, there's no one in these chairs today, but I know that someone in the Spirit needs this word right now. Receive in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel an earthquake for you, brother. I feel an earthquake for you, sister. There's deliverance coming, and you just wait for the wisdom to react today. You just wait for the wisdom to react because God is going to show up. God is showing up in Jesus' name right now. Just wait on his voice. Wait on the wisdom from heaven today. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Jesus, I praise your name. Oh, Jesus, I praise your name. I had more to teach today. I had more to teach, but right now I just feel the supernatural at work, hallelujah. I feel the supernatural at work in this lesson. Someone needs to sing in their midnight hour. Someone hasn't lifted, someone hasn't lifted their voice for quite some time, hallelujah. The, the circumstances of the world has gotten you down. The circumstances of the world has closed in on you. They feel like a jail cell. The walls get closer and closer, but if you'll find again today where the Lord brought you from, where he found you. You can lift up a voice of, that sings unto him, a voice, hallelujah, that worships him today. Just yield to him. Just yield to him today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, I thank you right now for your visitation. I thank you right now, God, for your word. I thank you right now for someone you've touched with the Holy Ghost. I thank you, Almighty God, Lord, that you don't leave us alone. Oh, Lord, that you come in the midnight hour to rescue your children. You don't leave us bound, God. Whenever we lift our voices to you, whenever we follow you, you don't leave us bound, Lord, but you set us free and you give us freedom. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty liberty today in Jesus name in Jesus name hallelujah hallelujah oh mighty God oh mighty God I praise you I praise you oh Lord let's just wait on him right now let's just wait on him right now I'm nowhere I'm nowhere near you I don't know if you're feeling what I'm feeling but I feel like I've tapped into a vein today. I feel like I've tapped into a vein of the Spirit. God's trying to speak to you. God's trying to prepare you today. Hallelujah. I'm almost out of time. I'm going to jump right to the end of this lesson. I, I, I'm not going to read the scriptures. I, I'm going to just, I'll let, you, I'll let you research it. On your own, I'll let you read the scriptures on your, your own. Send me a text. 
I'll get you hooked up. But sometimes there is a whirlwind in our lives. Sometimes life is like a whirlwind. And we don't know when it's going to stop or where it's going to go. And the Bible, the Bible tells us about a couple people who experience a whirlwind in their life. The first one, the first one was that I want to tell you about is Job. When we, when we look at the first, the first chapter of Job, we see that he has maybe 7,000 sheep or 3,000 camels. And anyway, we can look at the numbers. I don't know if I'm citing that completely accurate. But it, there are numbers written in there of how much Job had of each thing. And we know the story that he loses it all. He loses every bit of it. He loses his, his children. He loses his wife. He, he, he loses his, his animals. All of it vaporizes in, in just a moment. Job is broken. And then not only does he lose everything he has, he starts to lose his health. Laying around with boils, trying to scratch them and pop them. He's in desperate, a desperate situation. Toward the end of Job, Job chapter 38, God appears to, to Job in a whirlwind. A whirlwind. And when God appears in the whirlwind, he speaks to Job about his majesty. He says, Job, what? Essentially, two chapters worth of God telling Job of what Job isn't and all that God is. And whenever Job finds a place of repentance toward the end of the book, he realizes that God can do anything and he has a revelation of who God is. And when he has the revelation, and when he repents, and when he prays before God, God restores him. But God doesn't just restore him with what he had, but, Job, but the book of Job says the latter, the latter was greater. The, four, or the, the latter was greater than the former. In other words, if you look at how much God blessed him at the end of the book, you'll see he has double the sheep. He has double the camels. He has double everything that he had except for children. All right, now I want you to take that, and I want you to go back to me with the, about the story. I want you to go back to me to, uh, with me to 1 Kings and 2 Kings, to the story of Elisha and Elijah. Do you know today... What took Elijah up into the heavens? It was not just a chariot. It was a whirlwind. It was a whirlwind. And do you know what Elisha asked of Elijah? He asked Elisha, Elijah, I want a double portion. Sometimes in our life, there has to be a whirlwind before we can reap the double portion. Sometimes there has to be a whirlwind before we can get the blessing on the other side. Sometimes we have to lose some things before God steps in and blesses us with double. Sometimes we have to endure what we don't understand before God steps in and gives us what we didn't expect, a double portion. And today, if you're standing in the middle of a whirlwind, if, it, if life has been like a whirlwind, I'm telling you today, just wait because God will reveal it himself in it and when you get a revelation of God in the midst of the whirlwind you're, you can bet you I'm, you don't have to bet you can count on it that there is a double portion coming your way today hallelujah we've been struggling People been struggling with their mental health. They got the COVID stuff going on in their, in their mind. They're afraid. They're afraid of the riots. They're afraid of people. They're afraid of illness. And everywhere you look, there's nothing but a whirlwind. But if we'll just hold on today, there is a breakthrough. And there is a double portion that's going to come our way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if you believe it today, why don't you just clap your hands unto the Lord? Why don't you lift up a praise to Him today? Because there's not just deliverance coming to you. There's a revelation coming to you. And there's not just a revelation coming to you. There's an outpouring of a double portion. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm speaking to you prophetically today, I feel. I'm speaking the word to you today. That you're going to encounter the whirlwind. But when you do, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. If you have to repent, repent. If you have to wait to receive, don't leave. 
Elijah told Elisha to stay in the same place three times, but Elisha denied it. Elisha said, no, as long as the Lord my God lives and as long as you live, I'm going to follow you. And if you'll just keep following, if you'll just keep standing in the middle of the whirlwind, God will show you something new. And when he does, when he does, it's going to transform everything. Hallelujah. It's going to transform everything. Oh, Jesus. I thank you today for your word, Jesus. I thank you today for your word. I thank you today where you found us, Jesus, and where you called us out of. And I thank you today even so for the whirlwind. I thank you today, God, for the midnight hour where you have called us to lift our voices in praise and where you have called us to repent, Lord Jesus, to wait on you and to receive, oh God, what is on the other side once we have put our eyes on you anew. Oh Jesus, we need you today. Our faith is in you today. Our hope is in you today. And we have determined, God, to stand for you. We've determined, God, to follow after you. And even though, Jesus, things in this world seem uncertain, God, we know that you have all things in control. Hallelujah. I pray for someone today. I pray for someone right now who is experiencing a whirlwind in their life. I pray, God, that you would bless them with faith to stand and wait, God. And when you appear out of the whirlwind, to give them the wisdom to respond as you've called them to. If they need to respond through repentance, Lord, lead them to repentance. If they need to respond, O oh God, through greater discipleship, lead them to discipleship, God. Empower them today. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. And I'll tell you one more thing before I end here. This was also in my notes. Before Elijah... Before Elijah went up into the heavens. He took his mantle off, folded it up, and struck the waters and walked through it with Elisha. And when he went up to heaven, that's when the mantle came down. Now there's some interesting things uh, that happened there. But I felt the Lord just told me to leave that alone, leave, it, leave that for another time. So what, I've, what I have shared with you is the word of God that he has prepared for for me to bring to you. And I know that he has blessed you and I know that he has spoken to you. And I want to tell you today, just keep standing for your faith. Keep being one, keep, stay in one-mindedness. Be of one mind today. Keep your eyes on the goal. Keep your eyes on heaven. Keep your eyes on the testimony that remembers where God found you, what he did to you and where he's calling you to today. I'm excited for what the Lord is going to do. I have sorrowed and grieved for those that have been lost. For those that have passed on and maybe not had a preacher in their life to speak to them the gospel truth. Many have had a chance, but I sorrow for those that have left all too soon. And I pray that if there are any more to reach today, I pray that if there are any more to reach, oh God, that he would give me the strength to reach him. And I pray that same prayer for you. The, not, only, not, the, not necessarily the strength. We have all the strength we need in the spirit. But the wisdom and the guidance to reach those centurions that he puts in our way that we would miss if it wasn't for wisdom. Help us, God, to reach those. Help us, God, to be bold in our faith like Stephen was. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you for being with us this morning, for Sunday morning, uh, Sunday school. It kind of turned into maybe not so much a Sunday school lesson, but I feel like I have given you the word of the Lord. I pray his blessing be upon you, and I hope that we'll be able to meet you at our uh, second service. Just coming right up. It's our worship service. So stay, stay, uh, stay tuned, and we'll meet you in that second service. God bless you.